It's good to uh, see you all this morning for worship. Grateful for all of you who are able to come today. And um, hope that this is a day that you can enter into um, an even deeper relationship with the Lord. This, of course, is Palm Sunday. Christians around the world are celebrating today uh, the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, and we'll take a look at that in, in just a little bit as well. The first song, just kind of a, a welcome song, gathering song that we're going to listen to is Lift Up Your Eyes. Lift up your eyes and look for him, Jesus the coming Savior King, born to redeem the world from sin, bringing his peace to all. Now if you walk in darkest night, look for his dawn that's breaking bright, Nothing shall ever stop this light, bringing new hope to all. Oh, lift up your eyes, see the King. Worship the Savior, come praise Him, Jesus the Lord of Now lifted high, he is reigning. 
since we're celebrating that day, that great day when Jesus came in and was lauded in Jerusalem, the children gathered around and praised him. People laid their coats and palm, palms down in front of him. He certainly is worthy of our worship, and this song, Crown Him With Many Crowns, is, is part of that. This Savior King also is our Redeemer. It is because of him that we are here today. So we'll sing these two songs. There is a Redeemer and crown him with many crowns. Oh, for 
into our time of quiet reflection and asking the Lord what the Lord wants to teach us this week. Uh, for those of you visiting today, we want you to enter into this as well. It's a time that we just set aside for uh, communion with the Lord, a time where we try to listen. And if there is something that you believe is not only coming to you for your sake, but for the rest of the group, there's a microphone right up here. Heavenly Father, we would like to join Ollie in praying for this person and for these children. We know that you can do all things well. Come alongside this one. Strengthen her. Help her. Help her in ways that she hasn't been able to see um, how how important it is for her sake and for the sake of those she loves. Please, be kind to all of them and pour out your Holy Spirit on them. We know that changes like this don't happen easily and very often they just don't happen without your sovereign uh, work in our lives. So we pray with Ollie, asking for you to be gracious and merciful toward them all. Amen. Thank you, Ollie, for sharing your burden. We are instructed to bear each other's burdens and so fulfill the law of Christ. And now we can join him in a praying in an ongoing way for that. This morning we're going to take a look at, uh, again, the, uh, uh, the whole story of uh, Jesus coming into Jerusalem in those final weeks that uh, were part of his life. <clears throat> the little picture here you can see uh, is uh, a picture of a, a favorite place of mine. And uh, at the top of the hill up there is a cross. It's a huge cross up there. You can walk up this way and um, you can see some paths that kind of crisscross the hillside and go up to the cross up there. Next week, your brothers and sisters in Christ are going to be on top of that hill watching a sunrise as they celebrate Easter together. So it would be kind of fun to think about them this coming Easter um, as, they, as they celebrate too. So we're going to take a look at Matthew 21. If you'd like to turn to uh, Matthew 21, we're going to look at verses 
one following. And would you join me in reading the text? As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the mountain of, uh, Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell him that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, See, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. Jesus entered the temple area and drove out all those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of money changers and the benches of those selling doves. It is written, he said to them, My house will be called a house of prayer, but you are making it a den of robbers. That's the text this morning. Um, this is a, uh, an unusual thing. On this particular day, there was probably, you know, some estimates, 300 to 400,000 people had come to Jerusalem to participate in the Passover. And what Jesus found there was uh, not just a, 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 a lot of people, but the temple itself had been um, misused. It says in our text that Jesus rode into Jerusalem and that the people uh, praised him and said, Hosanna. They thought they were, there was going to be some kind of a change. They kind of hoped, I think, that Jesus would come right into Jerusalem and then make his way up toward the temple and go on up over to the Roman um, garrison and declare that he was their Messiah. Instead, he makes a turn and goes to the temple. The garrison was right on the left, you might say, if you were coming up the hill. It must have been an amazing thing. The temple had been rebuilt by Herod, and Herod built this very large fortress, basically, fortress above the temple. And it was supposed to be there for protecting the temple. It really wasn't there to protect the temple. It was there to control things. From that vantage point, the people from Rome, the Roman soldiers, could see everything that's going on down here. And if anything got out of hand, they'd be right down to take care of it. It was about control. In fact, the Romans didn't allow the priests who would serve in the temple to have their robes. They had to closet them in the fortress. And so every so often when they wanted to do something, they had, had to go to the Roman soldiers and they had to get their um, robes out of, the, out of this closet and bring it, bring it down. You can see it's, it's all built around control. Um, who's in charge? Well, this is just a reminder of who's in charge. 
And for Jesus to enter the Jerusalem at this time, and for such high hopes, people began to um, exclaim and say, this is Jesus. This is the prophet. They at least gave him that. This is the prophet that's come to us. Hundreds of thousands of people filling the streets. A victory parade forms on the edge of the city. A two-mile parade occurs that goes into the heart of Jerusalem. They say, this is the prophet from Nazareth, Jesus. He has to be the one. He just healed people who were blind. And it wasn't a very long amount of time ago where he healed and, and brought Lazarus back from the dead. So there's this great big stir in Jerusalem about who Jesus was. And they think this could be him. And then comes this wave of people and they see he's on a small don donkey, just like the prophet Zechariah said he would be. He isn't coming to Jerusalem like some arrogant Roman soldier on a, on a charger. He's coming as a humble king on a donkey. And the people cry out, he's got to be the one. He's the new king of Israel. Take off your coats and lay them down. Run and cut branches from the tree. and those. Let's roll out the red carpet for him. As he draws closer, the people yell, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Praise the new son of David. Blessed is the king of Israel. They are excited because the blessed one himself has come to judge the ungodly. And of course, they're not in that category. They think of themselves as the ones whom the Messiah would come to save and to remove the pagan Romans from power. But then something strange happened. He didn't veer off to the left to go to the fortress. He goes to the temple. And he drives out the people who are providing a service of convenience for all the pilgrims, pilgrim, those making a pilgrimage during Passover. Because the Jews couldn't bring their Roman or Greek coins into the uh, temple because, because they couldn't do that because they had um, images on them um, and that, that would be an idle kind of thing. They had to exchange them for temple currency. They had to pay also the, the temple tax. Now, there was a, an exchange set up so that a Jew could pay a fee that goes to the local bankers and also to the high priest's family. And because Jews were traveling from a great distance, they wouldn't have animals with them for sacrifice, so they'd have to purchase animals at a slightly higher price because of the, it was convenient. The money changers and those who sold the animals for sacrifice used to be outside the temple. But when Caiaphas, who was the high priest at the time, when Caiaphas came to power, he let them move into the temple courtyard. After all, how would they pay, the temple, to pay for the temple expenses unless this kept going? And Jesus confronts those practices. Now, you might ask, Who's violating this holy place more? The Roman soldiers with the high priest's garments locked inside or the temple bankers who are making money off of every poor person who'd come to pray? This text tells us that when Jesus comes into town, you just, you just never might know what he would do. He did something that people didn't expect. Jesus comes and he confronts the evil things 
in the hearts of people, his own people. Yes. Diane makes a very good point. And um, that, that all this business was being conducted in the court of the Gentiles. And that's one of the reasons that that was actually getting in the way of them being able to worship. Can you imagine? <laughs> uh, hundreds of thousands of people jammed into a city with animals all throughout this courtyard for them to be able to buy and, and sacrifice. It had to have been almost mind-numbing. You've probably been in some cities where they're just noisy and can, you have all the animals, have people selling things. And that area that Caiaphas allowed them to, to uh, come into was what Diane said. It was the place for the Gentiles to worship. There's a passage of scripture that uh, talks about them coming to worship and that God had set the court of the Gentiles up and, and said any, any person who's not a Jew from any nation if they would love to come and worship me, if they want to give themselves to um, what I've spoken to them through the prophets and what is given through the Holy Scriptures, if they want to humble themselves and, and uh, come and bring their sacrifices, I will surely accept those. This is talked about in, by one of the prophets in in the Old Testament. And here he says, but you, you've made this, you've made this place a, um, a den of thieves. Another gospel, John's gospel, in, uh, contains another, another phrase. He said, you've made it a emporium, basically is the word that we that we, it comes from the word, the, the word emporium comes from this Greek word that's used there. So you've made it a great big store here. Basically, Jesus is confronting the fact that all this religious preparation, pilgrimage, had gone south. People weren't in the courts who were selling and exchanging and taking advantage of the poor. They, they'd lost it. They'd lost the real reason to be in the temple. The temple was a place to draw near to God, to praise and worship God. All of these practices that they'd had were supposed to lead them to consider carefully the cost of sin that was evident in the animals that were sacrificed. The cost, the high cost of sin, and that Jesus would eventually be that lamb who was slain. And here were people getting in the way of others wanting to come and worship. Can you imagine trying to stand in the court of the Gentiles with all this going on and worship? It would be so difficult. Whenever someone, this may seem like a strong reaction that Jesus has. Um, it's not in light of who he was, both as a human being and God himself. I believe that Jesus um, believed in the Father's plan through the centuries to redeem humanity back to himself. I think as a human being, he looked at that and he believed that God was calling many, many people and that he was going to use him 
in particular in that plan. It was going to be a different plan, but he was totally committed to that plan. Absolutely committed to the plan of redemption of you and me. He would give himself as that great lamb dying for you and for me. So he rides into town and they begin to give him his due. This is truly the fitting response to who Jesus is to stop and to worship. But all these other things had gotten in the way so that people completely were disconnected with the fact that God was calling them to come and worship here, to humble their hearts, to say the same thing about their brokenness, their sin, as God says, and to find forgiveness, and to commit in a new way to God's way and will. That is exactly what he wanted for those. You see, in that entry, before he even got into town, one of the Gospels saying that Jesus stopped and he wept over the city. And he quoted a passage, Oh, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you kill the prophets. I would like to gather you under my wings but you would not it's heartbreaking to Jesus to see that kind of walling off of our lives from him so that eventually we just do religious things and there's no heart in it that's what he came to deal with that's why he addressed what he saw in the temple, wanted to correct it. When Jesus comes into town, he might and did challenge things that were dear to people. And at times, if we'll open our lives to him, he may challenge things that are dear to us, the things that are keeping us away from God or the things that are keeping others away from God because we're not as we could be. These are the things he challenges. He wants people to experience God and for people to not get in the way. And that's what we need as well. For us to not be in the way of other people experiencing Christ not just in an active sense, but also in a passive sense. We're in the way if there's nothing about us that distinguishes us as followers of Jesus. I'm not talking about looking good like the Pharisees liked to look good. I'm talking about a a dynamic of life that only Christ can produce in a person's life as they give themselves to him. That's the kind of life. It's all accomplished by him. Change, real change comes through him. Change for the better. Change for us all. Change for his church. And it's an act of his grace. I'd like for us to listen to a song that kind of goes on that theme. As people who've experienced the forgiveness of Christ, we should live humble lives. Live differently than the Pharisees who were proud, unbending, judgmental, yet empty. He calls us to be his humble people and to share the kind of sense of um, wonder that we have as we find forgiveness 
in Jesus Christ. Let's listen to this song. My worth is not in what I own, not in the strength of flesh and bone, but in the costly wounds of love at the cross. My worth is not in skill or name, in win or lose, in pride or shame, but in the blood of Christ that flows. in my Redeemer, greatest treasure, wellspring of my soul. I will trust in Him, no other. My soul is satisfied in Him. we begin right there and if we live in light of that um, there will come a humility to our lives I believe and Christ is pleased to share his gifts with his people and to use them to herald good news wonderful news to the people that we 
come in contact with. Brenda, I thank God that you took that step, sharing the gospel. It's one of the wonders that we've just been singing about and experiencing this morning, that we could be so loved by him. So Jesus came into town. He walked in with a lot to offer. I think that Jesus has things for you and me. What does he want for you and me? What is Jesus bringing to us? Some of the things I think that he was bringing to all of those gathered in Jerusalem. I think he wants us to see him as the one who is promised out of time, through all time. To see him high and exalted and yet also humble. Someone we can easily follow because of his example. Someone who shows us what the Father really looks like. I think he comes to invite rather than coerce. He invites you and me, and that's simply what we can do, is invite. I think Jesus, when he came into Jerusalem, wanted people, hoped that people would recognize who he really was. He was a prophet, and therefore, he is a mouthpiece from God. What he says is true. What he says you could bet your life on. I think he wants us to know that he loves the Father and what God has been doing, as I mentioned, through the centuries. Enough to give his own life to that plan. I think in the example that we see here also, that he disapproves of people trivializing and monetizing and peddling a sham version of what the Father really intends for us. A relationship. That's what he's been after all along. A relationship. He wants humility for us. For us to live lives that make people want to know more about Jesus. And again, not just because of us. It's because of him at work in us that people detect his goodness in us. I wonder if we could just pray for a moment and then we're going to have one final song that celebrates who Jesus is. Let's pray. Precious Christ, we, we think, can't thank you enough that you entered Jerusalem knowing full well what was going to happen. And yet you serenely accepted the pay, praise of those who walked in front of you and behind you. What long-suffering you have. We look to your cross and we hear you say, A Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. You must know, dear Christ, that at times we are the same. We don't know what we're doing, how we need you. Thank you for your mercy, dear King Jesus. Thank you for uh, standing in for us and giving us new hope. Be with us this week as we think about your Passover and your passion on Good Friday. We ask this in your name. Amen. Our final song.